from Los Angeles, California, the entertainment capital of the world. It's the 80s Movie Podcast. I'm your host, Edward Havens. Thank you for listening today. At the end of our previous episode, Vestron Pictures was celebrating the best year of its two-year history. Dirty Dancing had become one of the most beloved movies of the year, and Anna was becoming a major awards contender thanks to a powerhouse performance by a veteran actress, Sally Kirkland. And at the 60th Academy Awards ceremony honoring the films of 1987, Dirty Dancing would win the Oscar for Best Original Song, while Anna would be nominated for Best Actress, and The Dead for Best Adapted Screenplay and Best Costumes. Surely, things could go only up from here, right? Welcome to part two of our miniseries. But... Before we get started, I'm issuing a rare mea culpa. I need to add another Vestron movie, which I completely missed on the previous episode, because it factors into today's episode, which of course starts before our story begins. In the 1970s, there were very few filmmakers like the flamboyant Ken Russell. So unique a visual storyteller was Russell, it's nigh impossible to accurately describe him in a verbal or textual manner. Those who have seen The Devils, Tommy, or Altered States, know just how special Russell was as a filmmaker. By the late 1980s, the hits had dried up, and Russell was in a different kind of artistic stage, wanting to make somewhat faithful adaptations of books by late 19th and early 20th century UK authors. Bestron was looking to work with some prestigious filmmakers to help build their cachet in the filmmaking community, and Russell saw the opportunity to hopefully find a new home with this new distributor, not unlike the one he had with Warner Brothers in the early 70s that brought forth several of his strongest movies. In June 1986, Russell began production on a gothic horror film entitled, appropriately enough, Gothic, which depicted a fictionalized version of a real-life meeting between Mary Godwin, Percy Shelley, John William Polidori, and Claire Claremont at the Villa Diodata in Geneva, hosted by Lord Byron, from which historians believe both Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and John William Polidori's The Vampire were inspired. And if you want to talk about a movie with a great cast, Gabriel Byrne plays Lord Byron, Julian Sands as Percy Shelley, Natasha Richardson in her first ever movie as Mary Shelley, Timothy Spall as John William Polidori, and Dexter Fletcher. Although the film was produced through MGM and distributed by that company in Europe, they would not release the film in America, fearing American audiences wouldn't get it so Vestron would swoop in and acquire the American theatrical rights. Incidentally, the film did not do very well in American theaters. Opening at the Cinema One in Midtown Manhattan on April 10, 1987, the film would sell $45,000 worth of tickets in its first three days, one of the best grosses of any single-screen theater in the city. But the film would only end up grossing about $916,000 after three months in theaters. But... The movie would do quite well for Vestron on home video, enough so that Vestron would sign on to produce Russell's next three movies. The first of those will be coming up very soon. Vestron's 1988 release schedule began on January 22nd with the release of two films. The first was Michael Hoffman's Promised Land. In 1982, Hoffman's first film, Privileged, was the first film to be made through the Oxford Film Foundation and was notable for being the first screen appearances for Hugh Grant and Imogen Stubbs, the first film scored by future Oscar-winning composer Rachel Portman, and was shepherded into production by none other than John Schlesinger, the Oscar-winning director of the 1969 Best Picture winner Midnight Cowboy. Hoffman's second film, this Scottish comedy Restless Natives, was part of the 1980s Scottish New Wave film movement that also included Bill Forsyth's Gregory's Girl and Local Hero, and was the only film to be scored by the Scottish rock band Big Country. Promised Land was one of the first films to be developed by the Sundance Institute in 1984, and when it was finally produced in 1986, would include Robert Redford as one of its executive producers. The film would follow two recent local high school graduates, Hancock and Danny, whose lives would intersect again with disastrous results several years after graduation. The cast featured two young actors destined to become stars in Kiefer Sutherland and Meg Ryan, as well as Jason Gedrick, Tracy Pollan, and Jay Underwood. Shot in Reno and around the Sundance Institute outside Park City, during the early winter months of 1987, Promised Land would make its world premiere at the prestigious Deauville Film Festival in September 1987. 
but it would lose its original distributor, New World Pictures, around the same time. Bestron would swoop in to grab the distribution rights and set it for a January 22, 1988 release, just after its American debut at the then U.S. Film Festival, which is now known as Sundance. Convenient, right? Opening on six screens in Los Angeles and New York City, the film had grossed $31,000 in its first three days. Bestron would continue to slowly roll the film out into more major markets, but with a lack of stellar reviews and a cast that wouldn't be more famous for at least another year and a half, Bestron would never push the film out to more than 67 theaters at any time, and it would quickly disappear with only $316,000 worth of tickets sold. The other movie Vestron opened on January 22nd was Ettore Scale's The Family, which was Italy's submission to that year's Academy Awards for Best Foreign Language Film. The great Vittorio Gassman stars as a retired college professor who reminisces about his life and his family over the course of the 20th century. Featuring a cast of great international actors, including Fanny Ardant, Philip Nore, Stefania Standrelli, and Ricky Tognosi, The Family would win every major film award in Italy that year and it would indeed be nominated for Best Foreign Language Film. But in America, it would only play in a handful of theaters for about two months, unable to gross even $350,000. When is a remake not a remake? When French filmmaker Roger Vadim, who shot to international fame in 1956 with his movie And God Created Woman, decided to give a generational and international spin on his most famous work and a completely different story as not to resemble his original work in any form outside of the general brushstrokes of both being about a young, pretty, sexually liberated young woman. Instead of Brigitte Bardot, we get Rebecca de Mornay, who was never able to parlay her starring role in Risky Business to any kind of stardom the way one-time boyfriend Tom Cruise had. And if there was any American woman in the United States in 1988 who could bring in a certain demographic to see her traipse around New Mexico en natural, it would be Rebecca de Mornay. But as we saw with Kathleen Turner in Ken Russell's Crime of Passion in 1984, and Ellen Barkin in Mary Lambert's Siesta in 1987, American audiences were still rather prudish when it came to seeing a certain kind of female-empowered sexuality on screen. And when the film opened at 385 theaters on March 4th, it would only open to barely a $1,000 per screen average. And God Created Woman would be gone from theaters after only three weeks and $717,000 in ticket sales. Vestron would next release a Dutch film called The Pointsman, about a French woman who accidentally gets off at the wrong train station in a remote Dutch village, and a local railway man who, unable to speak her language, develop a strange relationship while she waits for another train. That never arrives. Opening at the Lincoln Plaza Cinemas in New York's Upper West Side on April 8th, the film would gross $7,000 in its first week, which, in and of itself, isn't all that bad for a mostly silent Dutch film. Except there was another Dutch film in the marketplace already, one that was getting much better reviews and was the official Dutch entry into that year's best foreign language film race. That film, Babette's Feast, was becoming something of more than just a movie. Restaurants across the country were creating menus based on the meals served in the film, and in its sixth week of release in New York that weekend, had grossed four times as much as the appointment, despite the fact that the theater playing Babette's Feast, the cinema studio one, sat only 65 more people than the Lincoln Plaza one. The following week, the appointment would drop to $6,000 in ticket sales, while Babette's Feast audience grew another $6,000 over the previous week. And after a third lackluster week, the pointsman would be gone from the Lincoln Plaza and would never play in another theater in America. In the mid-1980s, British actor Ben Cross was still trying to capitalize on his having been one of the leads in the 1981 Best Picture winner Chariots of Fire and was sharing a home with his wife and children as well as Camille Villa, a filmmaker looking to make his first big break in features after two well-received short films that he made in his native of Cuba before he defected to the United States in the early 1980s. When Villa was offered the chance to direct The Unholy, about a Roman Catholic priest in Orleans, who finds himself battling a demonic force after being appointed to a new parish, Villa would just walk down the hall of a shared home and offer his roommate the lead role. Along with Ned Beatty, William Russ, Hal Holbrook, and British actor Trevor Howard in his final film, The Unholy would begin two weeks of exterior filming in New Orleans, on October 27, 1986, 
before moving to a studio in Miami for seven more weeks. The film would open in 1,189 theaters, Vestron's widest opening to date, on April 22nd, and would open in seventh place with $2.35 million in ticket sales. By its second week in theaters, it would fall to 11th place with only $1.24 million in gross. But with the summer movie season quickly creeping up on the calendar, The Unholy would suffer the same fate as most horror films, making the drop to dollar houses after two weeks as to make room for such a dreck as Sunset, Blake Edwards' lamentable Bruce Willis-James Garner riff on Hollywood and Cowboys in the late 1920s, and the pointless sequel to Critters before screens got gobbled up by the Rambo 3 on Memorial Day weekend. The Unholy would earn a bit more than $6 million at the box office in total. When Gothic didn't perform well in American theaters, Ken Russell thought his career was over. As I mentioned earlier, the American home video store saved his career, at least for the time being. The first film Russell would make for Best Run proper was Salome's Last Dance, based on an 1891 play by Oscar Wilde, which itself was based on a story from the New Testament. Russell's script would add a framing device as a way for movie audiences to get into this most theatrical of stories. On Guy Fawkes Day in London in 1892, Oscar Wilde and his lover, Lord Alfred Douglas, arrive late at a friend's brothel where the author is treated to a surprise performance of his play Salome, which has recently been banned from being performed at all in England by Lord Chamberlain. All the actors in this special performance are played by the prostitutes of the brothel and their clients, and the scenes of the play are intertwined with Wilde's escapades at the brothel that night. We didn't know it at the time, but Salome's Last Dance would be the penultimate film performance for Academy Award-winning actress Glenda Jackson, who would retire to go into politics a couple years later, after working with Russell on another film, which we'll get to soon. About the only other actor you might recognize in the film is David Doyle, of all people, the American actor best known for playing Bosley on the 1970s TV show Charlie's Angels. Like Gothic, Salome's Last Dance would not do very well in American theaters, grossing less than half a million dollars after three months, but, again, it would find an appreciative audience on home video. The most interesting thing about Roger Holtzberg's Midnight Crossing is the writer and director himself. Holtzberg started in the entertainment industry as a playwright, then designed the props and weapons for Albert Pion's 1982 film The Sword and the Sorcerer, before moving on to direct the second unit team on Pion's 1985 film Radioactive Dreams. After making this film, Holzberg would have a cancer scare, and he would pivot his career to healthcare, creating a number of technological advances to help evolve patient treatment, including the Infusionarium, a media setup which helps children with cancer cope with treatment by asking them questions designed to determine what setting would be most comfortable to them and then using virtual reality technology and live events to immerse them in such an environment during their treatment, which is actually pretty darn cool. Midnight Crossing stars Faye Dunaway and Hill Street Blues star Daniel De Turbanti in his first major movie role as a couple who team with another couple, played by Kim Cattrall and John Laughlin, who go hunting for treasure supposedly buried between Florida and Cuba. The film would open in 419 theaters on May 11, 1988, and gross a paltry $673,000 in its first three days, putting it 15th on the list of box office grosses for the week, just $23,000 more than Three Men and a Baby, which was playing on 538 screens in its 25th week of release. In its second week, Midnight Crossing would lose more than a third of its theaters, and the weekend gross would drop to just $232,000. The third week would be even worse, dropping down to just 67 theaters and $43,000 in ticket sales. After a few weeks at a handful of dollar houses, Midnight Crossing would be history with just $1.3 million in the bank. Leonard Clotty, then writing for the Los Angeles Times, would note in a January 1989 article about the 1988 box office, that Midnight Crossing's box office to budget ratio of 0.26 was the 10th worst ratio for any major or mini major studio, ahead of In God Created Woman's 8th worst ratio of 0.155, but behind other stinkers like Caddyshack 2. 
The forgotten erotic thriller Call Me sounds like a twist on the 1984 Alan Rudolph romantic comedy Choose Me. But instead of jean vier Bougeau, we get Patricia Charbonneau. And instead of a meet-cute involving singles at a bar in Los Angeles, we get a murder mystery involving a New York City journalist who gets involved with a mysterious caller after she witnesses a murder at a bar due to a case of mistaken identity. The film's not very good, but the supporting cast is great, including Steve Buscemi, Patty Darbinville, Stephen McHattie, and David Strathairn. Opening on 24 screens in major markets on May 20th, Call Me would open to horrible reviews led by Siskel and Ebert's thumbs facing downward, and only $58,348 worth of tickets sold in its first three days. After five weeks in theaters, Vestron hung up on Call Me, with just $252,000 in the kitty. Vestron would open two movies on June 3rd, one in a very limited release and one in a moderate national release. There are a lot of obscure titles on these episodes, and probably the most obscure is Paul Monet's The Beat. The film follows a young man named Billy Kane, played by William McNamara in his film debut, who moves into a rough neighborhood controlled by several gangs, who tries to help make his new area a better place by teaching them about poetry. John Savage from The Deer Hunter plays a teacher who helps the young man, and future writer and director Reggie Rock Bythewood plays one of the troubled youths whose life is turned around through the written and spoken word. The production team was top-notch. Producer Julia Phillips was one of the few women who ever won a Best Picture Oscar when she and her then-husband Michael Phillips produced The Sting in 1973. Phillips was assisted on the film by two young men who were making their first movies. John Killick would go on to produce or co-produce every Spike Lee movie, from Do the Right Thing to Defy Bloods, except for Black Klansmen, while Nick Wexler would produce Sex, Lies, and Videotape, Drugstore Cowboy, The Player, and Requiem for a Dream, amongst dozens of major films. And the movie's cinematographer, Tom DeCillo, would move into the director's chair in 1991 with Johnny Swade, which gave Brad Pitt his first lead role. The beat would be shot on location in New York City in the summer of 1986, and would make its world premiere at the Cannes Film Market in May 1987, but it would be another 13 months before the film arrived in theaters. Opening on seven screens in Los Angeles and New York City on June 3rd, the beat would gross just $7,168 in its first three days. There would be no second week for the beat. It would make its way onto home video in early 1989, and that's the last time the film was seen for nearly 30 years until the film is picked up by a number of streaming services. It's never been released on DVD or Blu-ray. Vestron's streak of bad luck continued with the comedy Paramedics, starring George Newbern and Christopher McDonald. The only feature film directed by Stuart Markle and best known as Angel on the 1970s TV series The Rockford Files, Newbern and McDonald play two, well, paramedics, who were sent by their boss as punishment from their cushy uptown gig to a troubled district at the edge of the city, where they discover two other paramedics are running a cadavers for dollars scheme, harvesting organs from dead bodies, and selling them on the black market. Here again, we have a great supporting cast who deserves to be in a better movie, including character actor John P. Ryan, James Noble from Benson, Lawrence Hilton Jacobs from Welcome Back, Cotter, the great Ray Walston, and one-time Playboy playmate Karen Witter, who plays a sort of angel of death. Opening on 301 screens nationwide, Paramedics would only gross $149,577 in its first three days, the worst per screen average of any movie playing in at least 100 theaters that weekend. And Vestron would stop tracking the film after those three days. Two weeks later, on June 17th, Vestron released a comedy horror movie that should have done better. Waxwork was an interesting idea about a group of college students who have some strange encounters with wax figures at a local museum, but that's not exactly why it should have been more popular. It was the cast that should have brought audiences in. On one side, you had a group of well-known younger actors like Deborah Foreman from Valley Girl, Zach Galligan from Gremlins, Michelle Johnson from Blame It on Rio, and Miles O'Keefe from Sword of the Valiant. On the other hand, you had a group of seasoned veterans from popular television shows and movies, such as Patrick McNee from the popular 1960s British TV show The Avengers, John Rhys-Davies from the Indiana Jones movies, and David Warner 
from the Omen, Time After Time, Time Bandits, Tron. But if I want to be completely honest, this was not the movie to release in the early part of summer. While I'm a firm believer that the right movie can find an audience no matter when it's released, Waxwork was absolutely a prime candidate for an early October release. Throughout the 1980s, we saw a number of horror movies, and especially horror comedies, released in the summer season that just did not hit with audiences. So it would be of little surprise when Waxwork grossed less than a million dollars during its theatrical run. And it shouldn't be of little surprise that the film would become popular enough on home video to warrant a sequel, which would add more popular sci-fi and horror actors like Marina Sirtis from Star Trek The Next Generation, David Carradine, and even Bruce Campbell. But by 1992, when Waxwork 2 was released, Vestron was long since closed. The second Ken Russell movie made for Vestron was The Lair of the White Worm, based on a 1911 novel by Bram Stoker, the author's final published book before his death the following year. The story follows the residents in and around a rural English manor that are tormented by an ancient priestess after the skull of a serpent she worships is unearthed by an archaeologist. Russell would offer the role of Sylvia Marsh, the enigmatic lady, who is actually an immortal priestess to an ancient snake god, to Tilda Swinton, who at this point of her career had already racked up a substantial resume in film after only two years. But she would decline. Instead, the role would go to Amanda Donahoe, the British actress best known at the time for her appearances in a pair of Adam Ant videos earlier in the decade. And the supporting cast would include Peter Capaldi, Hugh Grant, Catherine Oxenberg, and the underappreciated Sammy Davis, the young British actress who was simply amazing in Mona Lisa, A Prayer for the Dying, and John Borman's Hope and Glory. The $2 million movie would come together fairly quickly. Bestron and Russell would agree on the film in late 1987. The script would be approved by January 1988. Filming would begin in England in February. And the completed film would have its world premiere at the Montreal Film Festival before the end of August. When the film finally arrived in American theaters starting on October 21st, many critics would embrace the director's deliberate camp qualities and anachronisms. But audiences, who maybe weren't used to Russell's style of filmmaking, did not embrace the film quite so much. New Yorkers would buy $31,000 worth of ticket sales in its opening weekend at the D.W. Griffith and 8th Street Playhouse, and the film would perform well in its opening weeks in major markets. But it would never quite break out earning $1.2 million after 10 weeks in theaters. But again, home video would save the day, as the film would become one of the bigger rental titles in 1989. If you were a teenager in the early 1980s, as I was, you may remember a Dutch horror movie called The Lift. Or at the very least, you remember the key art on the VHS box of a man who has his head stuck in between the doors of an elevator, while the potential viewer is warned to take the stairs. Take the stairs. For God's sakes, take the stairs. It was an impressive debut film for Dick Moss, but it was one that would place an albatross around the neck of his career. One of his follow-ups to the lift called Amsterdam would follow a police detective who was searching for a serial killer in his hometown, the killer using the canals of the Dutch capital to keep himself hidden. When the detective gets too close to solving the identity of the murderer, the killer sends a message by killing the detective's girlfriend. Which, if the killer had ever seen a movie before, he would know that you never do that. You never make it personal for the cop because he's going to take you down even worse. When the film's producers brought the movie to the American film market in early 1988, it would become one of the most talked about films at the market, and Vestron would pick the American distribution rights up for a cool half a million dollars. The film would open on six screens in the U.S. and on November 25th, including the Lemley Music Hall Theater in Beverly Hills, but strangely not in New York City. But a $15,000 first weekend gross would seal its fate almost immediately. The film would play for another four weeks in theaters, playing on 18 screens at its widest, but it would end its run shortly after the start of the year with only $62,044 worth of tickets sold. The final Vestron picture release of 1988 was Andrew Birkin's Burning Secret, Birkin, the brother of French singer and actress Jane Birkin, would co-write the screenplay for this adaptation of a 1913 short story by Austrian novelist Stefan Zweig about an American diplomat's son who befriends a mysterious baron while staying at an Austrian spa during the 1920s. 
According to the director in a 2021 interview, making the movie was somewhat of a nightmare as his leading actors, Klaus Maria Brandauer and Faye Dunaway, did not like each other, and their lack of comfort with each other would bleed into their performances, which is fatal for a film about two people who are supposed to be passionately burning for each other. Opening on 16 screens in major markets on Thursday, December 22nd, Burning Secret would only gross $27,000 in its first four days. The film would actually see a post-Christmas bump, as it would lose a screen but see its gross jump to $40,000 in the second week. But after the first of the year, as it was obvious reviews were not going to save the film, and awards consideration was non-existent, the film would close after three weeks with only $104,000 worth of tickets sold. By the end of 1988, Vestron was facing bankruptcy. The major distributors had learned the lesson independents like Vestron had taught them about selling more volumes of videotapes by lowering the price to make movies collectibles and have people curate their own video library. Top titles were harder to come by, and the studios were no longer giving up home video rights to movies they acquired from third-party sources. Like many of the distributors we've spoken about before, and undoubtedly will speak of again, Vestron had too much success with one movie too quickly, and learned the wrong lessons about growth. If you look at the independent distribution world of 2023, you see companies like A24 that have learned that lesson. Stay lean and mean. Don't go too wide too quickly. Try not to spend too much money on a movie, no matter who the filmmaker is or how good of a relationship you have with them. A24 worked with Robert Eggers on The Witch and The Lighthouse. But when he wanted to spend 70 to $90 million to make The Northman, A24 tapped out early, and Focus Features ended up losing millions on the film. Focus, the quote-unquote indie label for Universal Studios, can weather a huge loss like The Northman because they are part of a multinational, multimedia conglomerate. This didn't mean Vestron was going to quit quite yet, but, spoiler alert, they'll be gone soon enough. In fact, and in case you're newer to this podcast and haven't listened to many of the previous episodes, none of the independent distribution companies that began and or saw their best years in the 1980s that we've covered so far, or will be covering in the future, exist in the same form that they existed back then. New Line still exists, but it's now a label within Warner Brothers instead of being an independent distributor. Ditto Orion, which is now a specialty label within MGMUA. The Samuel Goldwyn Company is still around and still distributes movies, but it was bought by Orion Pictures the year before Orion was bought by MGM, so it too now is just a specialty label, but within another specialty label. Merrimax today is just a holding company for the movies the company made before they were sold off to Disney, before Disney sold them off to a hedge fund, who sold Merrimax off to another hedge fund. But Atlantic is gone, New World is gone, Canon is gone, Hemdale is gone, Cinecom is gone, Island Films is gone, Alive Films is gone, Concord is gone, MCEG is gone, Cinetel is gone, Crown International is gone, Lorimar is gone, New Century Bis is gone, Scurrus Films is gone, Cineplex Odeon Films is gone. Not one of them survived. And the same can pretty much be said for the independent distributors created in the 1990s, save Lionsgate, but I'll leave that for another podcast to tackle. As for the Vestron story, we'll continue that one next week, because there's still about a dozen more movies to talk about, as well as the end of the line for the once high-flying company. Thank you for joining us. We'll talk again soon. Remember to visit this episode's page on our website, the80smoviepodcast.com, for extra materials about the movies that we've covered on this episode. The 80s Movie Podcast has been researched, written, narrated, and edited by Edward Havens for idiosyncratic entertainment. Thank you again. Good night. (laughs) 